Welcome, everyone. I'm Professor James Levy, and I teach at NSU's College of Law. And I'm very excited to talk to you today about a, a particular passion of mine, Japanese kaiju toys. And I want to talk to you about uh, what these toys are, uh, the story of how I came to discover them, uh, and how they influence many of the artists in the great show that is taking place now at the NSU Museum of Art, the show Happy. Uh, how these toys have influenced those artists, and also more generally, how these toys have influenced the way a lot of contemporary artists are making art today. Um, by issuing limited, limited edition designer art toys, uh, this is also known as the urban vinyl movement, and it's really changed the way uh, artists and their fans produce and collect art. And all of that can be traced back to these Japanese kaiju toys, which you see here on the left. Um, so let me start with a little bit of background. Uh, the term kaiju is a Japanese word that means giant monster. And of course, the most famous giant monster of all time is Godzilla, or as he's known in Japan, Gojiro. And uh, the story of Godzilla is that following World War II, the Japanese economy was completely decimated. Uh, the Japanese had to rebuild their economy. And one of the industries that thrived in Japan in the 50s was the film industry. In fact, film historians say that uh, the 1950s in Japan was the golden era of Japanese cinema. Uh, one of the films created in Japan is the 1954 version of Godzilla, and it was a huge hit within Japan and a huge hit as an export around the world. The original Godzilla movie was in black and white, and it had a very serious and, and somber message. What the original Godzilla movie was about is it was an expression of the Japanese anxiety about uh, uh, nuclear destruction. And the story of Godzilla is that there is a atomic test that takes place somewhere in the South Pacific, and there is a giant sleeping dinosaur or lizard that's awakened by this uh, atomic test and then goes on to ravage uh, Japan. Again, it was a a huge hit both inside and outside of Japan, and it actually spawned um, uh, uh, a series of kaiju or giant monster movies produced by Japanese studios right up until the present. In fact, researching this a little bit uh, before this lecture, it turns out that Godzilla is actually uh, the longest running movie franchise in history longer than Star Wars, longer than some of the Disney properties. So very, very successful product um, for, uh, for the Japanese film industry. Now, a a as a result of the success of the original Godzilla movie, it led to a plethora of um, other Godzilla movies, or other movies in which Godzilla is fighting all kinds of other giant monsters. And although the original movie had a very serious, somber message, uh, the later movies were really geared towards uh, uh, Japanese children, and children in general. Um, and so, um, you know, I remember growing up in the 60s and 70s, and anyone who, who grew up during that period, you know, probably, rem probably has fond memories of seeing these movies on a Saturday morning or on uh, uh, you know, creature feature late at night of guys dressed up in giant rubber suits, you know, wrestling and beating each other up. And, and these are um, uh, all of the, the, the um, these are the <laughs> additional films in the Kaiju series that, that, was, that was started by uh, Godzilla. Uh, so here's a, a typical scene from a film called Destroy All Monsters that was released in 1968. And um, unlike the first film, these movies were really made to entertain children. Um, the monsters were never uh, too scary or too threatening or too frightening. Uh, typically, the movies involved uh, one monster acting as the hero and another monster acting as a villain. And you know, kids would watch along with these and, and they enjoyed kind of the, the campiness and the cheesiness of them. Um, uh, they, they, were intended to, they were intended to entertain and to delight children. And I certainly have you know, fond memories of growing up in the 60s and 70s 
and, uh, um, you know, watching these movies on Saturday morning, and, you know, you sort of recognize it's a guy in a giant rubber suit smashing cities to smithereens, and um, it, it, it was all in good fun. Uh, you know, it, it's sort of interesting because uh, the American film industry certainly had a, a subgenre of monster movies. So um, the American film industry had a uh, certainly a subgenre of monster movies, and, and most people think of the American monster movies as a classic monsters that were produced by Universal Studios in the 30s through the, through the 50s, and monsters like uh, uh, Dracula, Frankenstein, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Phantom of the Opera, The Wolfman. Uh, in contrast to the kaiju films of the 60s and 70s, th these were actually a, a frightening. They were actually intended to uh, uh, scare the audience and frighten the audience. Um, th they were not for little kids. But the kaiju movies produced by Sto Toho Studios following the first one um, were, were intended as a childhood entertainment. And if you were someone who grew up in the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, you probably, you probably saw a lot of these movies on Saturday morning or on Creature Feature late on a Friday night or Saturday night. And, and the reason that was is, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, there wasn't cable. And so if you lived outside a major metropolitan area, you maybe had one or two local TV stations. And those TV stations, were always looking for content, stuff they could put on late at night or stuff they could put on on the weekends to fill up the airwaves. And so one of the cheapest properties that they could get were these uh, Japanese kaiju movies. And so they became a staple of local TV during the, uh, the 60s and 70s. And a lot of kids were, were raised on these movies. And we sort of laughed along with the campiness of them. They, they were never too threatening. Um, interestingly, in the original Godzilla, Godzilla was a threat to Japan. Um, but in later iterations of the series, Godzilla actually became a hero. Godzilla actually became the defender of Japan and was defending Japan against some of these other crazy monsters. So it was all intended in good fun. It was intended to make kids smile, to entertain them, to laugh along while these guys in rubber suits were smashing balsa wood cities to, to smithereens. Um, now, fast forward, let's see. Um, so fast forward to, this is sort of my own story about, about how, I, how I discovered these, these toys that were based on these kaiju films. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So fast forward to the, well, let me, let me show this. So fast forward to the 1980s and 90s, and I'm, I'm living in uh, Boston at the time. And, you know, I was always somebody who was kind of into underground culture and alternative cultures. And, you know, I was a person, I was into punk rock, and I, and I you know, loved records, and I'd spend my weekends at record stores, you know, pouring through the bins. And I, I wasn't really a comic book person, but I always loved going to comic book stores because they just had just, just interesting things. And I wasn't a big graphic novel person, but uh, you know, I, I would occasionally buy a graphic novel, and I love the artwork. I love midnight movies. You know, I don't even know if they have midnight movies anymore, but uh, the movies that were typically shown at midnight on a Friday or Saturday night, and they were really cheesy movies, movies that are so bad they're good. Loved all that kind of stuff. And um, um, uh, you know, I was a skateboarder too, and. and People who tend to be into one of these one of these sort of genres, punk rock, skateboarding, comics, graphic novels, music, they, they, they tend to have, they tend to kind of run in the same circles and, and have kind of some overlapping interests. So um, I'm living in Boston at the time in, in the 80s and early 90s, and um, I found my way to a, to a tiny little store that uh, was like literally run out of a guy's basement. And he was only open on the weekends. And what led me there is I read something that he had soundtracks of the old Godzilla movies. And I just had fond memories of a kid watching those cheesy, goofy movies on a Saturday morning. And the soundtracks were always so good. So um, I thought, oh my god, there's, there's a store in Boston that is actually selling like import Japanese soundtracks to King Kong versus Godzilla. I got to go check this out. And I go into his store, and on a shelf, He's got a bunch of toys that, that look like this, these, these vintage Japanese kaiju toys. And, 
you know, my, my mind was kind of blown by it. Um, you know, I had been interested in vintage toys and space toys and robots and that kind of thing, but I'd never seen anything like these toys. And I sort of recognized the guy in the back with the three heads. That, that's Ghidra from um, one of the Godzilla movies. But look at the garish colors that monster is painted in. And there's another one here, sort of looks like a, like a melting candle. And this one kind of looks like, like a cockroach. But, but the, just the shapes and the colors were, were just so wild. I just, I had never seen anything like this. And it just, it kind of blew my mind. I get that they're monsters, but the juxtaposition of a monster, which, you know, in American culture, we typically associate with something scary and frightening and, and is, you know, gonna kill you. The juxtaposition of a monster with these wild, garish, almost psychedelic paint jobs just kind of blew my mind. And, and I'm gonna refer to this um, several times. It almost kind of creates a, a tension in these objects. It's almost like kind of two opposite things coming together. The monster, which is typically threatening and scary, but the garish, psychedelic colors, which, which suggest something else. So anyway, this little shopkeeper uh, um, kind of schooled me on, on what these toys were. I, I just, I'd never seen them before. And I was into this kind of stuff, so it was sort of surprising that I'd never run across it. And um, what he schooled me about is said that in Japan, the people in this country are familiar with the uh, Godzilla franchise. But in Japan, uh, that series of movies was so successful that it spawned an entire industry of kaiju movies and kaiju TV shows that were not seen outside Japan. It, it was such a popular genre that in the 60s and 70s, there were studios cranking out all of these kaiju-based TV shows. And every show would feature a hero or a good guy, typically fighting a villain or a kaiju every week. And there was pressure on the shows to come up with new monsters every week to pit against the good guy. And so through collecting toys, I found out about all of these TV shows that were just never seen outside of Japan. Ultraman. Ultra Q, Spectrum Man, Barone One, Mirror Man, Trident of the Sea, Flying Attack Human, Common Rider, Tiger Mask, Devil Man, Spaceship Yamato, uh, Tiger Seven, and that was just the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, and in connection with these shows, which were wildly popular among uh, 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 Japanese children, Japanese school children, along with the TV shows, Long before George Lucas got the idea of marketing Star Wars by creating collectible figures, there were companies in Japan, and these are advertisements for a company called Bullmark, that would make uh, uh, vinyl versions, plastic vinyl versions, of these kaiju monsters for kids to play with. And you can kind of see from, so these are two vintage advertisements, and you can kind of see from the one on the left, you know, it's this little boy, and presumably the scenario here is he's dreaming about all of his monster friends. So it's, it's kind of this um, interesting combination. They're monsters, yet they're intended to be companions, almost like a teddy bear for, um, for, for, for children. So wild, fanciful designs, but not threatening, not frightening. Designed to, to bring comfort, to bring maybe happiness. On the, on the right, is an advertisement for toys that are associated with a show called Mirror Man. Um, and so the, the history of these toys is that in connection with all of these TV shows, these crazy, wild, imaginative TV shows that, that were not seen outside Japan, there were toy companies in the 60s and 70s that would make these um, uh, blow-molded, vinyl toys by pouring molten uh, vinyl into a mold, pulling the toy out, and then if you can see back here in the background, there are all these women sitting at a table painting the toys individually. So when you see these toys in person, one of the things that, that, that first impressed me when I went into this shop in Boston and I saw monsters juxtaposed with wild psychedelic paint jobs, is when you start to handle them, you realize each one is individually painted. Each one is really like, like its own work of art. And there was uh, you know, a, a Japanese woman sitting at a table and all day her job was to take a spray gun and paint these kaiju monsters and paint the eyes and paint the lips and the mouth. 
And so when you, people who, who collect these things, one of the things that they're drawn to is each one stands as a, as a separate, independent, sort of sculptural work of art. Each one was hand painted. And there was some lady in Japan sitting at a table in the 1960s who painted the toy that you've now got on your shelf. So there, there, there was an artistry to them. Um, and uh, again, this is just a, a slide of um, uh, the, these department stores uh, back in the 1960s and 70s would actually hold contests for children, pick out your favorite kaiju. So it's a monster. But um, there's, it's, it's a whimsical monster, not intended to frighten or scare, but depend, but almost like a Japanese version maybe of a teddy bear. So kids would come into a department store and vote for their favorite monster toy. Um, this is just a, uh, a slide that just depicts today, because of the collector market, there are still uh, uh, several very, very small boutique companies that make uh, these Japanese vinyl toys for, for the collector market. And they make them the old school method. They're, they're vinyl poured into a mold, pulled out of the mold, and there's a guy who actually paints these toys one at a time. So if you're a collector of these toys, you realize, oh my god, you know, for 50 bucks, I can get a sculptural figure that's been hand painted by someone. It, it's an individual work of art. And so that's what this is, is depicting. It's, it's a modern toy factory, but they still paint these toys and produce them the old school way for, for the collector market. And this is one of the, the master painters, Goto-san, who has been painting kaiju toys one at a time, every eyeball individually, uh, you know, for, for 50 years. Probably painted hundreds of thousands of toys spread all over the world. What I learned is that, um, so when I walked into this shop, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, it was my first exposure to these toys, and I was just kind of blown away by them. Um, to just the, the, the whimsical nature, the fanciful nature that they were each painted by hand, that they combined all these crazy elements, elements of insects and animals and humans and, and robots and vehicles, and we, we just didn't have anything comparable in this culture. Um, the other part of the story is that there were other, uh, uh, many sort of creative types, musicians, comic book artists, graphic novel artists, were also getting exposed to these toys at the same time and started to collect them. For example, uh, the person who became my friend at this little shop in Boston, uh, he was in the music business. And he told me that um, you know, maybe some of the people listening to this lecture have heard of the Misfits and Glenn Danzig. My friend told me that, well, when Glenn Danzig was in Japan in the 80s touring, on his days off, he'd go into thrift stores and flea markets and he'd find these kaiju toys. And just like I was reacting to them, just kind of blew his mind, the designs and the colors. And so he started collecting them. Um, other musicians collected them. In major cities where there was a large Japanese population or perhaps a Japan town, like in LA or in San Francisco, you know, sort of the creative types who like to go out and explore and thrift on the weekends and, and go into you know, antique shops and that kind of thing. A lot of comic book artists and graphic artists were starting to get exposed to these toys and, and collect them as well as influence their, their art. Uh, maybe some of the people who are listening to this lecture collect urban vinyl toys yourself. And if you do, you're, you're aware of a company called Kid Robot, which started, I think, in the early 2000s and they became one of the largest producers of art toys. Well, the guy who's running Kid Robot now, Frank Kozik, along with a, another um, pretty famous underground artist, uh, Chris Cooper Coop, the guy who was behind the iconic uh, uh, smoking devil image, maybe some of you have seen, they were big collectors of these toys. And those were uh, two of the guys who revived the whole rock poster movement in the 90s, of issuing rock posters in limited edition that people would buy and, and frame. Uh, Kozik, who is head of Kid Robot and Coop, uh, were, were, were uh, at the ground floor of reviving this interest in rock posters. They were big collectors. They responded to these toys and thought that they were cool and became collectors themselves. And then the, the toys started to um, um, uh, infiltrate their, uh, their own artwork. So, um, I think, um, so, what, what, what I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get across is that, is that these toys are uh, so unique 
and combine such a, a, um, a creative and disparate array of elements, insect, animal, humanoid, robot, vehicle, inanimate objects. I'm going to show you a, a bunch of slides that illustrate what I'm talking about. But people were responding to these as, as objects, as just interesting and intriguing objects. I've heard people talk about I've heard people talk about, you know, some of these Japanese kaiju, it's almost like they spring from the subconscious. It's almost like there is a psychological subtext to them. You know, the, the interesting thing is that in this country, uh, many people collect um, uh, action figures or collect collectible figures. And a lot of that is because they have a connection to the character, like Star Wars figures or G.I. Joe, or they have a, a connection to the story that, that, that the figures play a part in, like the film series Star Wars. That, that, that's their attraction to the collectible figure, is they have a relationship with the character, or they have a relationship with uh, the story, or they have a fond childhood memory of getting a toy on Christmas Day, and they want to recreate that as an adult or maybe they didn't get the toys that they wanted on Christmas Day, and so they're trying to correct that as adults. The interesting thing about kaiju collectors is because the vast majority of us have never even seen the TV shows that they're based on, what we're responding to is just the figure itself. Um, we're reacting to the, to the figure and, and kind of the, the emotions that it's invoking evoking in us, whether just because, oh wow, that's like a really cool three-dimensional wild psychedelic paint job. Like rather than have a psychedelic poster, I can have a psychedelic paint job sitting on my shelf. Or they're, they're reacting to some other aspect of the, of the figure. They don't know the underlying story. They don't know the characters. And so it was sort of the beginning of this recognition that toys can exist as just art objects as objects that maybe carry a, 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 a second meaning or have a subtext associated with them, or are just really cool, beautiful objects, and I don't even know what the show is about. I don't even care. I just like the object. So let me take you through a, a bunch of slides and, and maybe kind of expose you to some of the wilder kaiju and why collectors were reacting in this way. And then I want to talk about how uh, the existence of these vintage toys has actually inspired several artists to work in this medium. That the art they create no longer has to be confined to a canvas on a wall or a poster. Hey, these toys are just kind of cool objects. And uh, the people who collect them, they, they re react to it, they respond to it. Well, gee, wouldn't it be cool if I could start issuing my own figure? And so several of the artists in the show, like Cause and, and um, Friends With You, and uh, Takeshi Murakami, they have started to, they have been, well, some of them have been working in this medium for, uh, for quite a while, issuing their own toys and th their, their own figures. They've taken maybe figures that, that exist in their paintings and turned them into three-dimensional collectible sculptures that their fans can buy and display on their shelf and, and relate to. So, so let me just take you through some of, uh, s some of the wilder kaiju designs. And um, you know, this is where the whole... Uh, art toy, designer toy, urban vinyl toy movement originates. It comes from this. So this is actually a, a really popular toy. The, the toy on the left is actually a vintage toy that was made in the 70s. And um, it's actually a, a Godzilla foe, or a Godzilla a villain named Hidoro, which is the smog monster. And the actual movie of the smog monster is, I think there's a lightning bolt that strikes like an oil slick, in a, in a body of water, and it turns it into this, like, glob of, of, of um, you know, this, this uh, living, breathing monster that's made up of pollution. And Godzilla in, in that movie is playing the hero, and he has to defeat uh, the smog monster. Well, you know, I've seen the movie. It's like, it's okay. But when I first saw this toy, it just, like, it just, like, blew my mind. I mean, it looks like, like a piece of, like, chewed up bubble gum or a melted candle, but, you know, it looks like maybe like, like a melted candle, and painted just in these, in these garish colors with a couple of eyes stuck in it. And so I just, oh my god, that's just like such a cool thing, I, I just, I have to have it. And actually, um, 
The Hedera figure is so popular among collectors because everyone kind of responds to it that way. It's like this goofy looking thing, looks like a chewed up wad of bubble gum, but painted in these like crazy psychedelic colors. Um, you know, this one is actually painted in camouflage. Some of these are, are glow in the dark. So that's just like a small sampling of the, of the plethora of smog monster toys that, that have been um, issued. And again, people are, they're collecting that because they, they enjoy they enjoy the, the figure as just you know a cool aesthetic thing that to have on the shelf, not necessarily because they have any connection to the to the TV show. Um, let's see. Um, so I'm just going to just take you through just just a bunch of these other toys, and, and uh, you know hopefully you'll you'll kind of you'll kind of feel some of the excitement that, that I felt when, when I first got exposed to these, and just how wild they are. This is a Jap these are cr uh, toys from a Japanese show called Barone One. Um, whoops. Uh, this guy is, is kind of based on Frankenstein, I guess. This is like a fish head monster. This is a, uh, uh, like a squid monster. Again, just these, these crazy juxtapositions of a, of a, squid, of a squid top with you know, human legs. Um, here is another collection of, of Barone One monsters called the Hand Demon. I've actually never seen this show, but apparently in this show they've made monsters out of, there's a Hand Demon, there's an Eyeball Demon, there's a Mouth Demon, and uh, here it is in isolation. And, and again, this, this sort of relates to why I think there's sort of a, maybe a, a subtext to these, or where there's something, you know, something kind of whimsical, but maybe also, also horrific about it. Um, just how, how a hand is, is kind of uh, uh, imbued with a human personality. And oops, keep doing that. You know, there, there's an eyeball up there. So it's, it's kind of wild, but maybe kind of creepy, juxtaposing these, the, these different elements. I mean, here's a, here's a crazy one, uh, an ear demon. So, you know, you can almost hear like the brainstorming sessions at some of these studios where uh, they're under pressure to keep coming up with new monsters for Barone One to fight every week. And well, you know, why don't we just take an ear and stick it on a body and he can be a villain that fights Barone One. You know, are, are the American film monsters are just so um, um, kind of so uh, uh, pedestrian and uninteresting in, in comparison to these. You know, it's, uh, we make monsters out of, you know, giving, giving the actor a hockey mask. Now you're turned into a monster. They make monsters out of, well, let's turn body parts in, into monsters. Um, it's another collection of, of toys. You know, eyeballs make, make good, good monsters. I have no idea what shows these come from, but I just know that those things are just, they're just cool. They're just cool, and I, yeah, I don't know how to put my finger on it, but there's just something about eyeballs and turning eyeballs into monsters. You know, who wouldn't want to have those on their shelf? Um, this is a monster called uh, um, uh, Tigan, and I kind of put this in as a little reference to uh, what Joe Exotic. Um, some crazy 70s show called Mirror Man, and this was one of the kaijus that, that fought Mirror Man, some elephant, but he walks upright. Uh, this is actually in the middle. It's actually one of the first vintage toys I, I bought in the 1990s. And this is also from, uh, from Mirror Man. And I, I just thought that this was just so creative and just so cool. They've turned a flame that you might see in your fireplace and they've personified it and, and turned it into a monster. This is actually a female monster or a female vi villain known as Kidifier. And I, I just thought, oh my god, that's like that's so cool. Like, who would think that you could turn a flame into into a creature that 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 would battle the good guys? Um, another TV show called Devil Man, and I think Glenn Danzig of the Misfits. I think he started a comic that was based on Devil Man, and I think he has been specifically influenced by this character and by these toys. Uh, from the 70s, so um, again, a lot of creative types working in different genres, comic, music, graphic novel, film, were, were just attracted to these. They just thought these things were, were so cool, and it, it, in, it influenced and informed their artwork. I'm just, I'm just showing you examples of just how crazy, you know, just how crazy some, some of these toys get. Um, you know, this, this is, is another just interesting aspect of this, is that on the one hand, 
Uh, Japanese culture in the 60s and, and 70s was uh, very, very conservative. Great pressure to conform. And there's the, the stereotype in the 60s and 70s of the salary man. You know, the Japanese businessman who they all wear the same suit, they go to work, um, uh, you know, they, they all conform, uh, rebellion is frowned upon. There is a saying in Japan that the nail that sticks up gets beat down. So the idea is you must conform. Yet in uh, the creative output in Japan at the time, maybe because there was so much conformity, I, I don't really know, but it's just, it's just a uh, kind of a, a, a fascinating comparison between how conformist the society was. But if you look at the comic books and you look at anime and manga and the TV shows, it was just creativity run riot. Creativity just completely let loose. And so what's going on here? I don't know if you can, if you can see this, but this middle kaiju, his head is actually a can opener. Now, you know, who would look at a can opener and say, well, let's turn that into a monster? The monsters on the end are obviously fork monsters. So, you know, who would think, well, let's just turn kitchen utensils or kitchen tools into a monster. We're kind of running out of ideas. Let's look for stuff around the kitchen that we can turn into monsters that will go up against Go Ranger next week on the show. Um, here, here's just another example of this. This monster is called Locker Man. I actually call him Refrigerator Man. And, um, you know, it's, it's cute, it's whimsical, but this also reminds me, I don't know if anyone watching this will be familiar with the, the film uh, Requiem for a Dream. There's a really um, horrific, nightmarish scene in that movie starring Ellen Burstein where her refrigerator comes to life and starts to attack her. And uh, this sort of reminds me of that. So it's whimsical, but maybe there's also a nightmarish quality to it. That your, your, that your kitchen appliances, what if, they came to, what if they came to life? What if they turned into monsters? Um, another set of just, just crazy, crazy kaiju. There's actually a book called So Crazy Japanese Toys. And I think that's a, that's a good way of describing these. Um, this is a monster. His head is comprised of ice skates. Well, you know, what's his superpower? Is he going to do skate on the, on, on the hero? Here's another monster. His head is a piano. Who would think to do that? Um, uh, another monster, his head is a gun. Well, that seems a little more, um, you know, a, a little more um, uh, uh, pedestrian, I guess, compared to some of these other monsters. Here's a monster, his head is a camera. You know, what was the, what was the um, production meeting about coming up with that monster? Well, yeah, let's just take a guy and we'll put a camera on his head. And his superpower is he takes pictures of the good guy. Um, other monsters. A, a monster with a locomotive on his head. A monster with a battleship on his head. I have no connection to these TV shows whatsoever. I've never seen them. I don't know what they're about. But I look at these figures and say, well, this is just so creative, so whimsical, so out there. Um, uh, the battleship monster, and here is a monster. Looks like an alleg looks like a battleship, a combination battleship and alligator. Of course, you know, we have Sharknado, you know, our, our cheesy exploitation movies are like Sharknado, where, you know, sharks get sucked up in a tornado and are attacking people on land. But nobody thought, well, gee, wouldn't it really be threatening if a shark was, contained, was combined with a battleship? Then, then you'd really have trouble. Um, so I, I just kind of respond to the, the, the creativity I, I, I see here. Um, these are kaiju that are, that, are, that are based in buildings or made out of buildings. I'm not even going to try and pronounce this, but this is a very iconic building in Japan, a very iconic tower, and you can actually see the, the, the clock tower there. And somebody decided, well, let's, let's build a costume that looks like that, and we'll put arms on it and legs, and, and uh, you know, he can fight the, the hero next week. This is a monster where the feet are actually a factory, and these are smokestacks. And his body is comprised of the pollution that's belching out of the smokestacks. Um, here's a monster, his head is a TV set, and that's actually the Tokyo Tower. You know, I, I have no idea what his superpower is. Um, another great monster called a Leaf Man. Just, you know, so, so whimsical, so crazy. Another monster, his head is a pineapple. 
Um, now this is this is just I, I, when I saw these, I just I, I had to have them. I have no idea what they are, um, but I don't know if this is like a Pac-Man reference. Um, I, I was not a video game player, so I don't know if that's a Pac-Man reference. But combining that head with women's legs and high heels, and then these are high heel monsters. I mean, it just to me, it's just an illustration of just how these Japanese um, designers—they just let their imagination just, just, just run uninhibited. I mean, it would just never even occur to me to to to, to create something like that. And yet, when you when you see it, um, it's just you know, I put these things on my shelf, and and uh, really, the the point of this is, you know, why can't these things be art? Um, I think that they are, and I think that the collectors consider them art. That I look at these things and they bring a smile to my face, or they cause some, maybe the, the refrigerator man causes some kind of emotional reaction, reminds me of, a, of, of the, the, hor the horrifying notion of the kitchen appliances coming to life and, and threatening you. And, and so, you know, really, that, that's what art is supposed to do. It's supposed to evoke a reaction. You're supposed to respond to it. And um, that, that's really what these toys do, and that's why collectors were when they would come across these things, you know, they're just some people who responded to them. Frankly, other people just, they don't care about it. They don't get it. Like, what is this junk? Why do you, why do you waste your money on this? Um, I, I just think they're just, they're endlessly cool. Um, here is just a, another example of just crazy, just a crazy juxtaposition of, of, uh, of, of objects in order to, to, to make something new, a monster. So his head is a TV set. His arm is an electrical plug that goes into the wall, and his other arm is, is the Tokyo Tower. I don't know what that means, what the subtext is. It's just crazy. And of course, that same company issued one that's a reference to uh, you know, Heath Ledger's character as the Joker. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the message is there, but uh, it's just intriguing to me. Why would you paint the Joker's face on the TV set that, that, this, that is this monster's head? I don't know, just kind of cool, kind of wild. Had to have that one. Now, now this, this, is, this is actually a really important slide because um, it illustrates the, the point that I'm trying to make about, I think some of these Japanese kaiju uh, have a subtext to them, um, or there is a psychological component, or it's as if they spring from the subconscious. And it also shows the influence on designer art toys, of, of which this is one, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a moment. But the toy on the left is a monster from a 1960s kaiju show called uh, Ultra, uh, yeah, um, Ultraman, a monster called um, Corona Sajin. And, you know, I just responded immediately to this. There, there's something um, just intriguing to me about juxtaposing a monster head onto a salaryman body. It, it sort of immediately reminded me of, you know, the great existential novel by Kafka, Metamorphosis, where, you know, the opening of Metamorphosis is Samson Greger awakes to find himself a cockroach. That there's something whimsical about this, but maybe also something nightmarish about it. That, that it can balance the, the, those two things. It's kind of goofy, but the thought of, you know, maybe the salary man is, you know, he's, he's really got the head of a monster. Um, or the monster is constrained by the salary man's uh, uniform. There's just something just compelling about that. So the figure on the right was actually put out as part of a series of toys by a Japanese company called Tokion. And this is a toy that was created by a, a New York graffiti artist named Stash. And so about, so in, in the late 1990s, when this toy was issued, it was actually issued as a series of toys by artists. And this is among some of the first art toys that were, that were produced. And just birthed this whole genre of you know, kid robot and uh, urban vinyl toys and art toys as collectible figures. This one was really in the first wave of that. And so you can see that the obvious influence of the, of the, the vintage toy to this one. And it was also the, 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 the recognition by artists that they think these objects are so cool. Wouldn't it be cool, rather than just you know, um, 
uh, make my art in a one-dimensional form on a canvas or my graffiti art, or the guy who created this toy is a graffiti artist, um, wouldn't it be cool to have my own collectible figure? I mean, why can't, why can't I take some of the characters in my art and turn them into three-dimensional art? That the fans of my work can collect and put up on their shelf and enjoy them just as much as a canvas or, uh, or a print. Um, in this line, although I don't have it anymore because I'm always you know, selling stuff in order to buy new stuff. I've got that you know, um, uh, uh, you know, terrible collector gene in me. But uh, one of the toys in this line was also a collectible figure that Shepard Fairey put out. And Shepard Fairey was the artist behind, is the artist behind Obey Giant and the Obama Hope poster. So at this time, he was uh, uh, releasing a vinyl toy. And this also corresponds with the time that Cause, who's one of the artists in the show, started issuing vinyl toys. Now, whether Cause is a collector of Japanese kaiju, I, I don't know. But I'm going to guess that in his travels to the Far East, he got exposed to these toys. And there was a whole movement beginning at this time in the late 90s, um, primarily in Hong Kong and in Japan, of artists starting to issue collectible figures. And that is, that is literally the origin of the entire art toy movement and the urban vinyl movement. It, it originates right here. And, um, you know, I, I remember going into uh, uh, Toy Tokyo in New York, you know, around the year 2000. And there would be, um, you know, they'd have lots of, of Cause toys, his companion figures. And that was the time when Cause was first issuing these toys. And they, they, if you're a collector of those things now, you know how impossible they are. They're just impossible to get. And they sell for thousands of dollars on eBay. But at, at the time, there, you know, there really wasn't that much interest in them. In 1999, 2000, they'd kind of shit, sit on the shelf for a while. But it, it directly comes out of this... Um, out of this era. The next slide is just, uh, it was sort of this, I think this kind of call and response between um, uh, the kaiju collectors and the artists who were inspired to start releasing their own figures. And then I think some of the kaiju producers got inspired by these art toys. So this is a, a toy called Death Run. And it's based on a 1960s, I believe, an anime image or a Japanese comic image. And what the maker started to realize is, well, I could use this toy as actually, it, it was intended as a kaiju toy, but I can actually use this as a platform, as a platform to make art. And so this maker paints all of these items individually, and they're actually sold in galleries. And they're sold in galleries in Japan, in Hong Kong, uh, like artwork. Here's, a, here's another trend, if anyone watching this is familiar with the cause dissected figure, which is his cause companion, but the, the, the guts are exposed. Well, this company started releasing death rates with the, you know, with the anatomical parts or the, you know, the guts exposed. And whether cause took his cue from these toys, or whether this toy maker saw the popularity of what Cause was doing and said, oh, wow, that's a great idea. Why don't we put out monsters and we'll, we'll, make, we'll make them with the guts exposed? So it's kind of this you know, call and response between uh, the original kaiju makers and now the artists who are issuing collectible figures, and now the kaiju makers are being influenced in turn by the art toys. This is a, a, another... Um, a figure based on a vintage Japanese anime, uh, uh, anime drawing or comic called Zagaron. And it's just an illustration that now the Japanese kaiju makers are uh, they're recognizing that their toys can be a platform on which to paint and do creative things. And so most of these are just individually painted one-off editions that again are, are sold in galleries. So um, the toys inspired art, and then the art toys inspired some of the kaiju makers to, you know, why can't why, why can't why can't our figures be collected just like art and displayed on the shelf like a, like a mini sculpture? Again, just uh, I, I, I kind of these figures are just kind of a, a good illustration of just how um, these toy makers are, are now using these toys as just, as just a platform for making art. 
And again, there's something about the juxtaposition of flowers and kind of psychedelic 60s flowers painted on a monster. It, it just doesn't really seem to go together, but there's something about creating that tension, that tension between elements that, don't, that you wouldn't expect to work together. But that's what makes them interesting. That's what makes you, when you look at them, brings a smile to your face, or just brings you back to them, makes them compelling. And like I said before, I think that's what art is supposed to do. It's supposed to evoke an emotional reaction. You're supposed to react to it, even if it's just happiness or joy, or bring a smile to your face, or it just, you know, um, brightens up a room. And so, uh, again, as you walk through the, um, uh, the great uh, show here, Happy, and uh, I know they've got a, a cause figure on display, and I can't remember whether I saw some, some Jeff Koons balloon dogs as, as part of that show, but other artists in the show are Friends With You, uh, Kenny Scharf, uh, oh, oh, definitely um, uh, uh, Takeshi Murakami. They have all worked in this collectible toy medium. They've recognized that, look, just these toys can, can be enjoyed independently of, of the show that they're related to, just as beautiful objects that just sit on your shelf and, and you enjoy them. And the artists themselves realize, you know, this is kind of a cool medium to work in. It allows the fans, the fans of my work, to collect my work, to have something beautiful in their home. Another a, a point I, I wanted to um, make about these toys is uh, there is a, a, a Japanese concept, and I, I don't want to misstate Takeshi Murakami's sort of artistic philosophy about super flat, but par part of what I understand about that is there is this um, concept in Japanese culture that high art and low art, um, they, they don't occupy separate worlds. In, in this country, there is the fine art world, the world of galleries, and then there's low art, uh, rock posters, uh, mass-produced items. Those are kind of looked down upon as, as low-brow art, as compared to fine art displayed in a gallery. In Japan, my understanding is sort of the, the, the philosophy is that all art kind of exists on the same plane that um, you know, it's perfectly appropriate to observe art in a department store or to buy art from a department store or anything that brings kind of joy or happiness or aesthetic appeal to your home is worthwhile. There is no distinction between high and low. They all kind of exist on, on the same plane. And I think these toys have kind of helped to um, translate that concept or transport that concept to um, uh, collectors in this country that I think the, the, the people who collect causes vinyl figures, or might collect a figure by Kenny Schaaf, or might collect a Takeshi Murakami figure, um, you know, they don't really care whether it's considered fine art or not. It's just something that, that, um, that brings beauty into the home, and they enjoy it. And, and so why isn't that, why isn't that a, a legitimate thing to do? So I think in that sense, these toys have, have kind of helped change the view of art among collectors. Again, I think collectors of these things, they don't, they don't, really, um, they don't really care whether others approve of it as, as worthwhile art. It's something beautiful, it's something cool, something I can have on my shelf. Uh, it, it, it enhances um, uh, my life by bringing a little bit of you know, happiness and pleasure into my life. And so my final slide here is, well, this is another example of some of these toys being used as platforms for making three-dimensional art. So my, my final slide here is uh, encourage people to view the show, collect toys. Um, if toys make you happy, uh, that's the goal. That's, that's, that should be the goal of art, is bringing some pleasure and happiness into your life. So on behalf of me and the Zagorons, uh, we, hope that, we hope that you enjoy the, the, the great show here at the Museum of Art. And I, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you.